All right, well, we're here for another Wednesday night with a master therapist, and this week um, we're fortunate to have uh, Dr. Jeff Ball with us. Um, and let's just talk, you have so many things that you've done. I was actually thinking about how to introduce you, and um, not to embarrass you, but I would say that you're a kind of Renaissance clinical psychologist, because we've had clinical psychologists who are uh, practitioners. We've had, um, like Colleen, we had Colleen here, mm -hmm. she's a practitioner. We had um, uh, Tarlo, who's also a practitioner. And then we had uh, Andy Christensen, we both know. And he's a practitioner and also a renowned uh, researcher. Um, and what else is there? David uh, we had Dave Mikowitz, uh, who, like Andy's a professor. So we've had professor therapists, we've had researcher therapists, we've had um, clinicians, but you did all of those, and now you're um, doing clinical administration. And I don't think that we really had, we've had people who run programs, clinical programs, but nothing like um, like you're doing right okay. now. Okay. So let's talk about that. I mean, tell us about the various things that you've done and then lead us into uh, PCH, which is a wonderful treatment center that you founded. Oh, thanks. I, I figured master therapist meant old. But, master. Uh, We've had several <laughs> definitions of master therapist. Uh, obviously, if you're asking that question, you have not seen our videos that are posted <laughs> on the YouTube. Uh, but um, we, in the early ones, we went over the definitions of a master mm -hmm. therapist. You can review them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and subscribe to our channel. <laughs> right. I mean, one of the things I, that I enjoy about this profession is that you can do a number of different things. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like I've had at least three different careers. Um, I started off uh, as an assistant professor actually at USC, which was difficult for a lifelong Bruin mm -hmm. to stomach. Yeah. And I, my office was overlooking the uh, practice field for the band, and so they would play Conquest all afternoon over and over again. Um, and then was teaching at UCLA, I was a lecturer there for, for many years and teaching um, both regular session, intro psych, abnormal psych, um, abnormal psych and extension for years. I've taught a graduate a, a seminar for the interns at the VA. I was also at the VA hospital for 13 and a half years. Um, and actually I was the head psychologist in a psych nursing home unit and taught a psychoanalytic seminar there um, I had some analytic training, did a lot of private practice for 30 years, um, doing primarily analytic practice, um, did some research early on with, with Andy Christensen and also with David Miklowitz on the bipolar study at UCLA, and then had an opportunity in 2005 to work at a residential treatment center um, as a psychoanalyst, and I started off seeing clients there and then they were going out of business and they said that they needed someone who knew how to run a program and was really good with groups and they came to me not knowing I'd never set up a program and I didn't do groups mm -hmm. um, but I said okay and found I had a knack for doing that and started a program that was out in the Palisades um, a six bed program that I grew to 18 beds and had some ownership and the the owner of that program, the, prim the majority owner really wanted to make it into a spa, more of a spa-like thing, raise the prices. So um, I decided to leave and start a PCH, um, which with the idea that I really wanted to create an alternative model of, of therapy um, that was not medical model, it was really a psychological treatment model, um, very holistic, with, with really skilled, experienced therapists. 
because I've seen places like Promises Treatment Centers and the Meadows out in Arizona and have visited them on marketing trips and found that they were very expensive. They had mostly something called KDAX, which is a drug and alcohol degree and master's level therapist doing groups. And my thought was, what if you had really experienced skilled therapists doing a lot of individual work, a lot of group work. So we set up PCH in 2010 um, and it's really grown because we have, we have a really unique treatment model, I think, which is very non-pathologizing, um, really good, good treatment. Colleen Kelly is one of our therapists, which is also. Um, so we really get people who've been doing this a long time and are really, really well trained and have found we, we get people who really are having a difficult time and they end up doing very well with us. So it's been a great model. We do a lot of family work. Yeah, and I want to get into the, the philosophy, you know, of the treatment center. That's going to segue into, you know, a main topic today. But um, just before we do that, there was one thing that you said that was very interesting to me. And I've seen this with people, uh, as a difference with people, um, in that when they uh, propose that you start this program and do these groups and you had done neither of them, you said yes, and you went for it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I hear from students or young therapists that they have these opportunities and they say, well, I'm not qualified for this or I've, you know, I've never done anything like that. And um, I say, well, everybody hasn't done anything until they do it, you know. Exactly. And some people um, go for it. And look, the fact that you went for that really changed your life, didn't it? Yeah, it, it totally did. It, and it, it, that's a r really good point, that um, I felt like all the different things that I did, from doing academia, doing research, um, doing uh, different kinds of therapy trainings, doing the Bipolar Project with David Miklowitz, um, all of those things prepared me for doing this. And, mm -hmm. you know, there were times I, I thought, well, I wish I'd done it 10 years earlier. And I realized I really couldn't have, that I really had to have all the experiences I had to be able to put together the kind of program that we did. Yeah. Um, and, and I think you're right. You know, it's funny because you think of what we've been really successful. I, I think success is really a combination of being in the right place at the right time, but also being ready mm -hmm. for it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. ready and and ready to to take that risk take that opportunity mm -hmm. you know even though in some ways emotionally you felt ready but in a kind of narrow credential you had never mm -hmm. done that but you decided right. to do it and it was interesting I remember when I was um, studying reading about places like Chestnut Lodge which was a psychoanalytic place back east um, where they treated a lot of schizophrenics that were unmedicated with psychoanalysis and there were some amazing papers came out of that place. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I remembered when I heard about the place that I ended up taking over, it had a similar idea, but it just wasn't run very well. Right, so, right. Yeah. Okay, so um, do you want to talk more about the philosophy of PCH? And, and because the topic today is about, you know, the myth of mental illness. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if we're overstating it, but certainly questions about uh, the concept of mental illness um, and and how that evolved in uh, your work at PCH. Sure. You know, I worked um, both at UCLA and at the VA hospital for several years and I couldn't stand the way mental health care was delivered, which was heavy psychiatry, heavy medication, um, not talking to people, and diagnoses would just get kind of passed down. There were times psychiatrists wouldn't even see the, their patient. They would just continue a schizophrenic diagnosis with heavy medication. Um, and, you know, it was just, they, were, they didn't have a relationship. I'll tell you sort of an interesting story. Our medical director called me over one day and she said, can you go see Mr., I'll make up a name, Mr. Goldberg is, refusing his medications. And he just threw me out of his room. He's swearing at me. And she was doing rounds with all the psychiatry residents. And I went in to see Mr. Goldberg. Mr. Goldberg was, oh gosh, he was about 450 pounds, 
guy who's a former New York stockbroker, had terrible sores on his legs, was in a lot of pain. And I go in there and I said, what's going on? He goes, that fucking bitch is trying to give me these meds. I had side effects and I don't want them. I don't want to take them. I said, you're the one in pain, right? He goes, yeah. I said, she wants to give you something else that may not have those side effects. Take your fucking medication. He says, fine. <laughs> so, so I go out to the medical Classic director. Classic analytic technique. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I spoke to him in his own language. Did you not? Yes, <laughs> yes I did. <laughs> so I went out to the medical director who was doing the rounds, and I said, you can go back in, he'll take his meds now. And she looked at me, and she goes, what did you do? As though I was this miracle worker. And I said, I have a relationship with him. And that's all it was. But, which was pretty rare for psychiatrists in, in settings like that, particularly with managed care, where they might see someone for 15 minutes and diagnose them and give them medication. Right. So, you know, when we went to start PCH, you know, I, I felt like, and, and also, you know, the other thing in hospital settings, psychiatry is at the top of the tier and psychologists are relegated to kind of a secondary role. And I've always, I've never really seen why the medical model is used for a lot of the, the things that, with psychological problems we look at. Um, and, so, you know, we started, we wanted to start a program that was run by psychologists with some medication and psychiatry as adjunctive. In the time since we started PCH, I've done more and more research, um, you know, the whole chemical imbalance theory that antidepressants are based on that started in the 1950s, 60s, has totally, has really been disproven. They found no evidence for it. Um, they haven't found any clear genetic markers for any of the disorders in the, in the diagnostic manual. So all of these medications and medical interventions are based on nothing. They're based on no medical, no biological evidence of any of these disorders. Um, you know, and what, what's happened is the diagnostic system, which started off in the 18, it was 1890s with Kraepelin, who had yeah. two diagnoses. He had dementia praecox, which we call schizophrenia, and there was manic depression. The current system, I think we're up to DSM-5. I, I stopped buying them at DSM-3. But... Um, it's a huge number. It, I, I think it's 600 diagnoses or something like that. And they're basically all dictated by pharmaceutical companies who are in, heavily involved in all of it. And there's no scientific basis for them. They're, they're basically a cultural, culturally derived system where doctors get together, both mostly white men <laughs> get together in, in a committee and they vote on these diagnoses. I'll give you one example. The second diagnostic manual um, was very psychoanalytic and depression and anxiety were part of the same diagnosis. Uh, they, there was a debate about whether to break them into two separate diagnoses for depression and anxiety. And there was a committee of 14 people. Um, five of them voted to split depression and anxiety apart, four voted against, and five abstained. So basically now we have these two separate diagnoses that are separately medicated, so the pharmaceutical companies love it. And it was decided by five out of 14 people that these are separate diagnoses. And the way medicine looks at the diagnostic manual, it's like their Bible. So these, you know, but this is how these things are derived. They're very arbitrary. And, you know, the, the other issue is that psychiatry was in trouble in the 60s and 70s. And 70s. Um, they were very psychoanalytic. They were seen by other medical professionals as, as speaking psychobabble. They, were, they weren't seen as a real science. So they basically, when they revised the DSM-3, it was really to create this biological kind of model underneath all of it. Um, you know, which, again, hasn't been borne out yeah. by anything. I, I, th I see it also as from a political point of view, not just the pharmaceuticals from a monetary um, commercial point of view, but if you medicalize human problems, then you make pills and you treat them. If you don't endorse the medical model, 
and that people's um, distress are born out of certain kinds of cultural conditions, then it would assume that you would change those cultural conditions, which is a lot more expensive and time consuming than, um, than just giving pills to people. No question. Yeah. So I think there's, um, you know, I think there is um, politicians who are against a sort of community intervention uh, model and they want it more individualistic and they don't really want to change social conditions. Um, they like the medical model. Mm -hmm. There's no question. And it, it also becomes a way of controlling people. Um, it, it's, I mean, if you look at the whole idea of disorder, and which is really a medical kind of term, and, and actually we don't, in, in general, we don't use the term at, at PCH, um, a, along with personality disorders, which I don't really believe in. I think that they're trauma-based. I think these are really pejorative labels to give people. And they tend to make them other, which is, which is re-traumatizing someone. And so, but if you look at, you know, we were talking about sort of the myth of mental illness. I, was, I, I brought up the myth of normal. What does normal mean? Mm -hmm. um, if you look at uh, the diagnostic manual, a normal person is someone who doesn't show any depression, anxiety. Um, they don't protest anything too much. They don't have swings in emotions. Um, they are produ they're relatively productive. They're, you know, sort of like the bourgeois kind of model existence. Fits into um, a corporate structure. Which fits into doesn't a corporate complain, structure. Doesn't complain, doesn't have distress, doesn't, right. you know, doesn't protest. Exactly. Very even keel, fits into the model. Right, and yeah. that, that's what's considered normal. And anything outside of that is considered disordered or abnormal. And, you know, there, there are countries like Russia, our, you know, our, our future country, <laughs> 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 um, that have, you know, that's how they treat dissidents, is they will treat them as, as mentally ill right. and lock them up. Um, you know, we're not that far from it in terms of chemically, you know, doing that to people. And what about, what about, you know, I mean, it's persuasive what you're saying, but there are certain disorders that just feel like there's some really strong underlying physiological process. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned schizophrenia, bipolar. Um, what do you think about that? Can, can the, can the non-medical model apply to all of the conditions that, are, we, that come to our attention? Well, I, I think that there are biological undercurrents of some of these things. We, now, we don't know what they are. We haven't found them. Like I said, you know, a lot of psychiatry is based on a chemical imbalance model, which isn't, which doesn't work. Um, so they haven't found what they are, but there are, there is a need for some medical intervention in certain more severe conditions. Now, what they've done is they've created, you know, and even I, I know someone who was labeled schizophrenic who's getting his PhD now, who's speaking in a number of places, and finds that, first of all, the question is, what are the treatments for these kinds of things? Um, we know that for anxiety, the main treatments are benzodiazepines, which are horrible class of drugs that should probably be outlawed. They actually make your anxiety worse in the long run. They're incredibly addictive. Um, their withdrawal is worse than heroin withdrawal from benzodiazepines. Um, we have antidepressants that have really severe side effects that really shouldn't be given long term. There's some real questions about how much damage they do to people long term. And 20 years of research have shown they're not much more effective than placebo. Um, particularly for mild and moderate depressions, they're no more effective and they're slightly more effective for severe depressions to help someone get out of bed. Um, so you have a drug that's really limited effectiveness. I just read a statistic that of people over 12 in this country, 12% are on antidepressants, mm -hmm. which is a huge number of a drug that's not very effective and yeah. has bad side effects. 
What about so. what about drug therapy for uh, really acute, powerful conditions like a manic episode? Do you support mm -hmm. that? Oh, definitely. I, I think you know mood stabilizers are one class of drugs where, again, they're not sure what the mechanism that they work and things like lithium, but you can usually find one that doesn't have great side effects and will help to level out mood. Um, and in those cases, I think they're a good adjunct to treatment. I don't think there's anything that medication alone is that helpful for. I think all of these conditions um, are, you know, functional kinds of, of conditions that where there's an interaction with environmental factors and stress particularly. So I know you heard from David Miklowitz and um, in, in that study, which is something we do at PCH as well, when someone is, has some bipolar illness, um, we believe in mood stabilizers as well as stress reduction, because stress tends to exacerbate just about everything. Um, a lot of psychoeducation, so someone could be a good consumer. And social skills training, helping sleep hygiene. There are a number of things that you can do to, to help somebody learn to manage something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are real questions of what really is underlying a lot of these things. And, you know, there's a, there's a great book that I would recommend. I, have you read Anatomy of an Epidemic no. by, by Whitaker? And it's really about the modern history of psychiatry and how many conditions, many disorders that they name are atrogenic. They're really caused by the medications that they use. And that what will happen is they will medicate someone, there'll be terrible side effects, and then they'll medicate the side effects. And then you'll see lots of different kinds of symptoms pop up. And there are, there's, a, there's a website also that Robert Whitaker runs called Mad in America. And there are lots of people with stories that where they feel they've been severely damaged by medications over the years. So I do think there's a place for them. I believe there's a place for a biopsychosocial model. But I think it probably should be in reverse. I think it should probably be a social psycho bio model mm -hmm. in terms of the influence of each of those areas. And the problem is that psychiatrists don't tend to be real collaborative in practice. Yeah, but there's a lot of people, you know, like the 21st century is being hailed as the century of neuroscience. Mm -hmm. And also there are genetic advances going on now. Is it possible that we will find these elusive biological markers uh, as we get more uh, skilled in genetic assessment and also um, neuroimaging? I think it's possible that we will find some genetic markers. We haven't found, the only things we've found for are things like Huntington's and uh, there are a couple of conditions. Um, but then we have the epigenetics coming right, into it right. in which you have thousands of molecules that attach to each gene and they're affected by the environment. So these molecules can turn genes on and off. And so what you basically have, even in a genetic model, it won't be purely genetic right. because there's a huge environmental impact, yeah. which is often downplayed by medicine. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, the hope is that there will be some, but uh, in terms of what we can learn from that, I'm not sure right, how right, much, right. really. How about um, you know, going through this sort of tour of things that just on the surface, seem to be fed by some underlying physiological or neurological condition, like what we're you know, calling autism spectrum disorders. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you view autism in this, in this perspective? That's a, a great question. I, you know, I, when I first started out as an undergrad at UCLA and, and beginning a graduate school, I worked in autism research. Um, in those days, and this is the late 70s, early 80s, it was one out of 1,500 kids. You know, now I've seen statistics of one out of 40. And it's one of the issues that I think a lot of these spectrum disorders, they've now made bipolar spectrum disorder. I think what it does is it broadens the diagnostic criteria and becomes an economic kind of thing. I think it becomes, you know, the, the more kids you can treat, if it's one out of 50 kids, um, there's a whole cottage industry around that. Mm -hmm. I think there are really autistic kids. I think it's probably one out of 1,500 kids. Mm -hmm. And I think any kid who's a little quirky or has any kind of delays is put on the spectrum now. And they're given lots of five days a week of ABA treatment or floor time or these different kinds of things, and people are making a lot of money from it. Mm 
Yeah. And when they say they're curing them, those aren't the same autistic kids that we worked with 30 years ago. Um, That's I think, an area yeah. of, of the medicalization of therapy, the extension, not, not just broadening the range of symptoms that are seen as disorders and treating them pharmacologically, but take, also going down further in the developmental scale, like starting younger and younger mm -hmm. to diagnose uh, kids. Yeah. That's, that's one of the extensions that I, I find uh, most objectionable. Mm -hmm. You know, seeing kids, treating kids uh, with um, ADHD really, you know, quickly or um, labeling them bipolar, you know, at a very young right. age. Um, yeah, and, it, and then, you know, in certain areas, medicating them. I mean, medicating yeah. five-year-olds with medications that, again, we have no idea what the long-range effects of some of these. And some of them, I've seen things where, you know, people will have shorter lifespans on some of these medications. I mean, they're really severe mm -hmm. consequences. You know, the, um, the ADH thing is a great example because if you look up the diagnosis of ADHD, most of us qualify these days. <laughs> um, you know, there, there was something I saw a year or two ago about um, that the human attention span is less than a goldfish, no? <laughs> um, which, you know, they only have one thing to focus on is food Right, that's true. They're surface. an advantage. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, you know, I think with all of the stimulation that we get now, yeah. it's, you know, I used to be able to read books, it's, it's much harder. Yeah. these days yeah. to be able to focus but the, when when it's stimulants that you're giving children and Adderall is chemically identical to crystal meth so you're basically creating meth addicts mm -hmm. you know and um, and there's not great evidence that they really ha that they really work all that well yeah. what about um, I'll dedicate this one to Bradley because I was, this, this question was jogged in my mind uh, from you, which is, what about a disease model of addiction? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I don't, you know, the, the definition of a disease is that there is a common etiology. Mm -hmm. And addictions, there are 30 different etiologies to what makes up addiction. I think there probably are some addictions that may have a genetic component or biological component. I don't know that most of them do. Mm -hmm. And so, again, even, you know, when you get into sort of labeling people, um, and that's part of my problem with the whole disorder idea as well. Um, let me get into addiction in a minute. We're talking about bipolar. When you put bipolar on a spectrum and you say bipolar 2, um, we have at PCH so many clients who come in, and we use the word clients on purpose and not patients because we're not a medical model, um, with a bipolar 2 diagnosis that, you know, these are people that are dysregulated. They may have trauma and their mood is dysregulated. Within the same day, psychiatrists don't have any tools for that. The only tool they have are mood stabilizers. And so they will diagnose someone bipolar 2 who's not bipolar. And I think that happens quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, of alcohol, it's interesting. In the past, they might have called them borderline and they may have called them borderline. personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, but I think when psychiatry made the decision, which is probably 25, 30 years ago, to just become psychopharmacologists, their only tool is medication. And there's that old adage, you know, when everything, <coughs> when all you have is a hammer, everything's a nail. Now, it's interesting um, that we're seeing the beginnings of a movement for clinical psychologists with specialized training in uh, pharmacology, clinical pharmacology, to be able to prescribe um, psychological, psychiatric medication. Mm -hmm. what do you, how do you think the, because it seems like that's going to happen. I think there are five states now mm -hmm. that it, you can do it. Although they were talking about that when we were in graduate school. Yeah. <laughs> Last year, you mean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. No, no, but I think it's yeah. actually happening now. Mm -hmm. And this is where the control of the insurance companies um, is good because if they can move the um, prescription to another discipline, especially a discipline that charges less than psychiatry, then they get more people prescribing 
and some of them prescribing for less. So mm -hmm. I think they, we have the support of the uh, insurance industry and the pharmacology industry. So I'm very confident that, um, that psychologists will have prescription privileges mm -hmm. in some kind of way. Do you think because the training of clinical psychologists is different than psychiatrists, that that might change the approach to medication? Or do you think we'll be sort of co-opted into that uh, medical, medical model? I think it's a great question. I, you know, it's funny, when they were talking about this 30 years ago, um, and at the time, I thought that was something I might have wanted. Now that I see what the medications are, you know, again, aside from mood stabilizers and some very low-dose antipsychotics. Well, the, the thing would them, be that would the granting of prescription privileges to psychologists, given their non-medical training in graduate school, would that lead to the, them being more circumspect and not falling uh, for this um, hypermedicalization of of disorders, or would it go the other way around? I, I think um, I would guess that psychologists would be more careful medicators. I, I would think so. Yeah, you know, I mean, some probably wouldn't. They'd be right. pushing pills all over the right. place. But I do think that there there might be more of a balance. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's also the question to me you know, going back to sort of diagnosis and, and our diagnostic system, you know, it's, it's a system in which we, you know, there are symptoms define these different disorders that come up. And then we label people with these, yeah. these disorders. Um, you know, I went back and read, is everyone familiar with the Rosenhan study from the 60s? Rosenhan um, on being sane in insane places. Exactly. The best title ever. It is a great title. Yeah. It's actually a great paper. Yeah. You go back yeah. and read yeah. it. And what he did was he put pseudo patients in psychiatric hospitals all over the country. And I think there were 38 of them or something. Um, supposedly like normal people. I think some of them were psych graduate students. So I, don't I know think they were told but to just report that they were having hearing voices that were exactly. saying empty hollow thud. Exactly. Empty hollow thud. But that they had heard them on, uh, on admission, but then yeah. they never showed another symptom, and their goal was to get out of the hospital as quickly as they could. I think the average was 40 days or something like that before they could be released, and they were released as schizophrenic in remission. Yeah. They, weren't, they had not shown a single symptom, but in the context of a psych hospital, if they were asking what time it was, if they were taking notes, those were seen as pathological behavior. They're paranoid, they're obsessive, you know, exactly. they're writing a note. The, the interesting thing to me about that study was, yeah, when they interviewed after the person, after the study was gone, and they interviewed the, um, the clinical staff about the person, as you were saying, they said they were, they pathologized, you know, regular behavior, and if the person wasn't exhibiting anything that they could judge, they called them schizophrenic in remission. Like you never got, you know, right. cured or, or, rid of it, or uh, rid of it. But the most interesting part of the study, which is not really reported that much, is that they also interviewed the fellow patients of the pseudo patients. And they were extremely um, accurate in saying that this person's a fraud. Yeah. This, is not, this is not a schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. I love that part of the that study. That was great. There was another really interesting part of it, too, yeah. where Rosenhan talks about type 2 errors in medicine. Mm. And he says that in medicine, there's a tendency toward a type 2 error, which is a, a false positive, where you don't want to underdiagnose in general medicine because if you miss something, it could be life-threatening. And so they will often overdiagnose and they'll make what's called a type 2 error, which will resolve itself pretty soon. You'll realize that was the wrong diagnosis because you won't see those symptoms continuing. In psychiatry, you make a type 2 error, you give someone that diagnosis, they never lose it. Right. The Rosenhan study is a great example. They didn't show right. any other symptoms, but they were schizophrenic in remission. So you're labeled schizophrenic, that's going to be it. Yeah, and, and I always thought that was very like ironic because if you if you go to the doctor, you want to be cured 
right? Mm -hmm. um, and the, the idea that the people we're working with, that we're trying to cure them, I think that becomes the standard when it's a medical model. Mm -hmm. But do you think in terms of cure, when you're working with somebody? No, it, it, it's, it's really interesting. I've had um, families um, come in to PCH and they'll say, what is your cure rate? And I'll say, actually, it's zero. Um, you know, we don't really cure the human condition. But if they're with us for a while, they'll be doing much better. That's good. And, you know, the reality is that that's, that's a very what, good answer. I, I really well, like thanks. that answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, I, think, <laughs> I think what the medical model does is it makes the human condition into disorder and illness. And, you know, if you look at, psych at psychological or psychiatric symptoms, all of them are adaptive symptoms at some point. So how many of you dissociate? How many on your drive to, to school, you come every day, how many don't remember the ride sometimes? How many are dissociating while we're talking? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. So the point being, we all dissociate. Now imagine someone very close to you, a parent or, or a brother or something, when you're two or three years old, is, is having sex with you. It's very adaptive to leave, to dissociate and go somewhere else. And that's what dissociative identity disorder is, is that people, they almost always have a horrible sexual trauma history and their coping, their defense is to dissociate, which is a very adaptive thing. If, if we kept any of you awake for a week, you will hallucinate. Mm -hmm. Again, if, if, if you're not sure what's causing that, you're gonna come up with an explanation, which is a delusion. So all of the symptoms that we talk about are adaptive at some point. And so at what point, and the, and the person who I know who's getting his PhD who was labeled schizophrenic at one point and says he survived those meds, he said, you know, he'll give an example, how many of you felt your cell phone go off in your pocket and it's not in your pocket? That's a hallucination. So, you know, again, these things are on a continuum and yet we pathologize them. And, you know, Gaber Mate is a psychiatrist up in British Columbia who says the worst place to get treated for schizophrenia is the Western world. Hmm. Because how they, do they How do they respond in, the, in other cultures? Other cultures are sometimes in a village, they might be revered. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're hearing things, they're seen as visions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that in our culture, we try and make the symptoms go away. And so we medicate people to the point where they're non-functional. Um, and it may be, you know, a better approach is to help people learn to live with those symptoms and just not act on them. Right, right. Um, and remove the anxiety from them so they don't experience them as much. Yeah. When, when you've talked about this, when you've gone into the lion's den of a VA hospital or a medical uh, facility, kind of, um, well, let's say like where Dave Mikulitz is working or something, mm -hmm. um, and you've talked about this, what, is, what are the attacks that you get? What are the, the points of um, debate? It, it's, it's difficult. I remember talking to a psychiatrist on the ward at the VA and saying since there's a lot of research that shows that antidepressants are no more effective than placebo or that many schizophrenics, when they're, you're given a drug holiday, that you'll find they no longer have the symptoms and don't need the meds anymore. What do you think about giving someone a drug holiday and discontinuing them? And the reaction I've gotten was, well, if they relapse, it'll be more work for me, so I'm not going to do that. Right. So, you know, you're usually met with a lot of resistance. I've, I've been um, debating some of these things on, a, on a, some Twitter uh, <laughs> feeds where I've had psychiatrists come back and call it fake news. When you describe the, you know, 20 years of research by, um, what's his name? I'm blanking on the name, but who wrote uh, The Emperor's New Drugs and... Um, Anyway, you know, a psychologist in England who did 20 years of multivariate analysis got all of the data from the uh, Freedom of Information Act, because the drug companies don't publish and, and hide the negative data. He found that there was really no difference between placebo and antidepressants. There was a slight difference, but they weren't double-blind studies because 
patients that were on the antidepressant from the side effects they knew and the doctors knew as well. So what he replicated it with active placebos that had side effects and found zero difference between them. And that, that begs the question that if you take a more psychosocial model and you, you know, pair it against primary medication treatment, mm -hmm. is it superior? Mm -hmm. Do you, is there right. data for that? You know, I'm not sure what the, what the data says about that. I mean, what's interesting is, uh, you know, my reaction is that placebo is really underrated. That, um, that what is placebo? It's basically the expectation that your doctor is giving you something to make you feel better mm -hmm. and that that makes you feel better. And what it goes back to is the relational aspects, which, you know, in all the years of studying different models and and doing therapy, you know, and, and you find this in the outcome data too, that it's therapist characteristics that tend to trump everything. Right, right. And so, you know, my feeling is the relationships where the healing happens in all of these things, and in medicine as well. That, you know, if you're trusting your doctor and they're listening to you and they're giving you a medication, that medication is going to work better. Right, right. I agree with that. Yeah. All right, well, let's, uh, let's open it up and just hear what uh, people in the audience, questions that you have, thoughts that you have for Jeff. Anyone? Yeah, go ahead. I've got a uh, schizophrenic patient who would usually normally be treated with medication right away. If you, How would oh. you deal with them if they were in your company? Could you repeat the question for the tape because uh, it won't pick up? Well, the question was if someone came in who was schizophrenic and... How would they be treated with medication right away? Yeah. How would you treat them? Um, well, I'm not, our psychiatrist would put them on as low dose an antipsychotic medication, which, you know, I, I always say our psychiatrist is one of the few that psychologists will ask him to increase the medication he won't because um, he's a very careful medicator. But... Um, I think you put someone on as little as they can with it, where they're not going to suffer bad side effects. And hopefully with that and good treatment, it helps contain it. I mean, they have to be controlled enough they can profit by language, right? That real, and, and, the, and the relationship that you're talking about. No question. Yeah. And same thing with someone who is so depressed they can't get out of bed, probably needs an antidepressant to help them at least get into therapy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one thing, can you hear me that? at my little chart. So, you know, one thing... You brought props? I brought a prop. <laughs> so, because I always just draw it in the air and Allie made me a chart. By right. me. But, you know, our current diagnostic system and the DSM, you have these sort of vertical diagnoses based on symptoms that you're depressed or you're anxious or you're borderline or you're bipolar. And I think a more useful way, an alternative is this kind of a... a, a a layered kind of approach where we don't diagnose people, but we diagnose cognitive and emotional states. So, you know, I always put quotes around normal because we don't know what that is. Um, but then you have sort of anxious states, depressive states, borderline states, um, dissociative states, and psychotic states. And so the idea is all of us can under the right or wrong conditions, we'll visit these areas. We'll, oh, sorry. We'll visit these different areas, but that, you know, people that we tend to treat tend to be triggered and live down in these more, more often than, than we do. But I think when you look at it that way and you're not calling the person a schizophrenic or a borderline, which is one of my pet peeves, is, is I really think the borderline diagnosis, I, I always say we use it for... Uh, clients we don't like, and all my friends' ex-wives. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's a really pejorative label. And it's actu actually, the whole idea of personality disorder, again, is a construction of a committee of people who got together. Um, we all have personalities, and we all have personality difficulties. And they're incredibly unreliable to diagnose, and they're really pejorative. And I think what you find when you look at complex trauma, the symptoms are identical to what we call borderline personality. And it's a lot more efficacious treatment-wise to say to someone, I want to help you with your trauma, than to tell them that they're borderline. Right. 
So, and it's also a diagnosis you never shake. If you go online and read about it, it says you're going to be this way the rest of your life, basically. So that's my prop. All right. Yeah, yeah. I'll read. You know, I, I don't know enough about it to comment on it. I don't know if you do. Or. Um, well, you have a couple of groups of PCH and yeah. FGAP. You need to like, <laughs> get out of the office. Uh, <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, maybe you should answer that, Jackie, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Yeah, I do think that they, um, as we talked about in class, that they would... ACT practitioners would look at um, suffering and um, difficult states as a product of, you know, our minds, as a normal product of our minds, and that what gets in our way is how we respond to those um, normal productions, and we give them overemphasis in our life in try instead of trying to let go of them, have them diffuse, and to substitute more constructive action. So I do think that ACT is, um, has a climate of non-pathology, and I think that's an interesting connection you made to what Jeff was talking about. Mm. There, there's another approach um, developed in Finland called Open Dialogue. I don't know if people have heard of that. But it was an approach, they had a high incidence in a small town in Finland of schizophrenia, and someone developed this Open Dialogue approach, where a team of therapists would go into the home, strip away your professional title, go in with your first name, and they would sit and talk with the person about what the voices were saying that they're hearing and try and help make sense of them. And then if the person felt overwhelmed, they could go to their room, but the, the only requirement was they had to leave the door open and just listen. And they found that the incidence of psychosis in that town plummeted that it was a really effective approach. And that is something we're trying to do a training and, and implement. So again, the idea is that if you can destigmatize and normalize a lot of these difficult symptoms people live with, part of, I think, what exacerbates them is when you're medicating them, trying to make them go away, they're, they're, they're resisting that. When you can normalize it and say to someone, let's understand what the voices are, let's, let's work on not acting on them, um, they probably the anxiety around them goes down and you'll, they'll experience them less. I think also when listening to you, how you would describe it to a client, that it takes a lot of the shame away. Mm -hmm. You know, so many people who have these uh, issues and states and what we call disorders, uh, they are accompanied with so much shame and that's a, that's a big battle there, as opposed to taking um, this more humanistic uh, approach of it. No, that's judgmental. No, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Renee? Um, I was really surprised in the beginning when you said that the neurochemical imbalance is not a part of a lot of disorders, um, because you hear about like the MAOA gene in like, aggressive behavior, um, and you see that like schizophrenic, uh, or like it, the prevalence rate of schizophrenic people is like higher for um, monozygotic twins for like identical mm -hmm. twins rather than like um, fraternal twins. Um, my question is like if you don't think that uh, the research is there for like the gene part and like the neurochemical right, balance, right. why would it show up in family history? Very good question. For like addiction and like mood disorders mm -hmm. and schizophrenia. That's a good one, Jeff. Well, that is. I, I, I think there are genetic components to some of these things. And by a lot of, I'm just saying we haven't identified what any of them are. And that we don't know how they play out in terms of those things. So, you know, the, the environmental, it sounds as though from the epigenetic research that environmental influences are very, very prevalent even when there are genetic markers. And so what I'm saying is when you're basing um, 
medical interventions on something that you ha you have no idea what's the actual cause. Um, there was a term I saw that was biobabble as opposed <laughs> to psychobabble. Mm -hmm. um, that you know the antidepressants, for example, are based on this idea of a chemical imbalance, which has been shown to not happen. Um, you know, there are lots of things that increase serotonin that don't affect depression, for example, lots of other drugs. So, you know, I'm not saying at all that there are no genetic components to some of the things that we deal with, but we don't know that they're related to the whole syndrome, the group of symptoms that we're talking about. Um, we don't really know exactly what that's related to. Um, you know, that, and, and with alcoholism, I mean, we, I see lots of people who are, have some bipolar issues and they self-medicate. Lots of people self-medicate with alcohol. It's a different ideology than someone who has some genetic loading. And I, and I know there are people who have genetic loadings for it. That physiologically, they have a different reaction to alcohol than others. But the problem is that, with the, particularly with the 12-step movement, everybody's lumped in the same category. And that's where I think the, the diagnostic systems don't really, I, when, I, when I taught abnormal psych, for, I taught it for 25 years, I used to hate the term abnormal psych, first of all, for the name of the course. But also, you know, I would go over the whole sort of labeling theory and how dangerous labels are, and then we'd spend the rest of the quarter talking about these different labels. People never fit those categories as neatly as they do in the book. You know, they're all, people are much more complex than that. And that's, I think when you, when you give people these labels, you kind of lose the complexity of who the person is. Yeah. Well. I'm always preaching to the class that you treat a person with a symptom as opposed to a symptom that's housed in a person. Hmm. And just having that uh, orientation, I think, leads you to be more apt to connect with them, be mm -hmm. interested in them as a, a human being. Yeah, there's some, I've been reading more, too, about something called the clinical gaze, which is how physicians tend to look at patients, mm -hmm. and they really see them as a constellation of symptoms. Right. And the person feels unseen often. There was a great paper I read that brings up Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, mm -hmm. and how the monster is protesting to Dr. Frankenstein that he's a person. He just sees him as a lot of parts uh -huh. that he put together. Right. right. Um, Any other questions, thoughts? Yes. You mentioned that in some tribe or other societies, um, people labeled schizophrenic could be seen as, or could be revered. Have you seen that TED talk about that? No, but no, I haven't seen that one. But Hmm. And they'll, they'll become a medicine man or medicine woman, possibly. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts about uh, whether that's possible. Could you succinctly repeat the question? That's a <laughs> tough one. <laughs> that in, in, in some cultures, that um, in some villages, I, I imagine people are seen as sort of a medic, they could become a medicine man or something like that who has schizophrenic symptoms? Is that? Yes, after they mm -hmm. took control. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah, I, I mean, I, I could see how that could happen if the culture supports it. Um, you know, I think their cultural anthropologists look at their cultures and, and, and common beliefs that would be seen as crazy in ours, and vice versa. Um, there's also a really good TED talk by a young <coughs> British woman um, who was labeled schizophrenic and was medicated and she ends up seeing a psychologist who gets her off the medications, and, and the line that she uses in it, she said, doctors need to stop asking what's wrong with you and ask what happened to you. And which really feels like a very, you know, sort of captures what our approach is mm -hmm. to things. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for coming in, Jeff, and oh, talking sure. with us, really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, guys. All right.